This past Saturday, the terrorist organization Hamas launched a brutal attack on Israel. The footage going around that day was quite horrifying as the IDF and Israeli intelligence were seemingly caught off guard and civilians took the brunt of the violence. Uh, now, you know, Israel has declared a state of war and has since begun retaliatory attacks. This happened to coincide with a visit to China of six U.S. senators, one of which Chuck Schumer expressed his disappointment directly to Xi Jinping for the PRC's lack of condemnation, which was, I think, reminiscent of their reaction to the Ukraine war. China has been rather quiet, calling for restraint on both sides, but avoiding the specifics and the brutality. Miles, what are your initial re uh, reflections on this act of war against Israel and China's reaction to it? Well, first lesson we should learn is uh, we let our guard down. And uh, at dawn, good people slept in the morning and not allowed the, um, the terrorists to, to take advantage and launch this unprecedented brutal attack. Constant vigilance is the price of liberty. And this applies to the Taiwan situation, to Indo-Pacific as well. So that's number one. This is about peace in the Middle East. The upcoming Israeli-Saudi peace initiative is going to be very significant. People who are the enemy of peace do not like this. That's why there's a Hamas attack. And they want to disturb uh, the peace uh, process. And the, the country behind all this is Iran. Now, you mentioned about these two countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran. They're both strategic partners of China. So China could play a very important role in this crisis, but China chose not to because they did not want to take side. They failed to condemn the Hamas terrorist attacks. And by virtue of that, they failed to condemn Iran's role in this. And this is a very peculiar and uh, so yesterday there was a, a discussion at the UN Security Council. China's position is also very ambiguous and opportunistic in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, it calls for ceasefire. I mean, Israel has a right to retaliate, to defend its country. At this point, you call for ceasefire. Basically, you, you, you're, you're opposing Israel's right to defend itself. Secondly, China's emphasis is on this so-called two-state solution. This sounds all very good. I mean, it is also a long-standing policy of the United States government, too. In other words, there should be the Palestinian state, there's the Israeli state. The problem is the majority of the people in Gaza, they do not recognize Israel's right to exist. And that's the problem. And for China to champion this two-state solution, it sounds very weird and strange. That's because, on one hand, China definitely endorsed this two-state uh, solution to many of the international crises. For example, China recognized both former East Germany and West Germany. China now recognized both North Korea and South Korea. When it comes to its own crisis, China never recognized Taiwan should also be concluded in this two-state solution. So China say one thing and does another. I mean, so there's very little credibility on that. Uh, Taiwan and China, there are two states. That's the ultimate solution. Uh, China does not want to, um, to contemplate that. The continuous avoidance of condemning the culprit, in this case Hamas, shows uh, China really does not have the credibility to be the global leader because principle matters. I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, it, it does seem like China has, has long tried to maintain a sort of balancing act between countries that have tensions. And, and this is really evident in their stepping into the Middle East since the U.S. has stepped out. They're uh, trying to mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia without taking a clear side in any of these longstanding disputes. Do you think that this could be a, a decisive moment in in compelling them to have to take a stance? I mean, there's been some concern in recent years, uh, especially from the U.S. perspective, about Israel getting closer to China. W will this force them to, to begin to choose sides? Um, and, and could you maybe talk a bit about what Israel-China relations have been like up until this point? Israelis have a very... Uh friendly relationship with China. I would not say, you know, um, as solid as the Israeli relationship with the United States, mm -hmm. uh, mostly on a transactional uh, basis. Now, you mentioned about the challenge to Americans' foreign policy. That's very true. These Hamas attacks on Israel actually pose a serious challenge 
to peace. And、uh, not only that, but also pose a serious challenge to European and American leadership. Let's just say Europeans. There have been a lot of Muslim immigrants in many European countries in recent years, and those immigrants have、uh, become a very big domestic、uh, political issue in those countries. Some of the leaders cave into the、uh, the extreme、uh, rhetoric coming out of the Muslim communities in their country, and they basically, you know,、um, became coward, did not really rise up to the moral challenge. But、uh, this is the challenge to European countries. I'm so glad to see leaders from most European countries: Germany, France, Denmark, Sweden, Norway,、uh, Spain. Most of the countries have now make it very clear that they condemn the Hamas terrorist、uh, as the culprit for the current price,、uh, crisis. Some other countries, you know,、uh, uh, should also learn the lesson.、Um, you, you look at Canada. Canada has a very strange relationship with India right now. And because of this, this、uh, assassination accusation, whether true or not, I think you know Canadian could have done a better job in in dealing with the Indians through a much less confrontational approach. The reason Canadian government has done this because there are over eight hundred thousand Sikhs who live in Canada, who play very important role in some of the key voting areas in Canadian politics. So、uh, I think that's a very, very uh, uh, disturbing development.、Uh, I'm not saying、uh, Canada is wrong or India is wrong. There, I'm saying is there is a better way to、yeah. deal with the major problems among two democracies, particularly when the world is facing the major challenge from China. Both Canada and India are very strong support of the American strategy focused on China. So that's why、uh, whatever is going on in Hamas poses a serious challenge to European leadership, to American leadership. What's going on in Hamas also is very, very、um, important. That is,、uh, is a major destruction for Americans' strategic focus on China. This administration has been fighting the temptations to shift American strategic focus on China and go back. To Europe and the Middle East. Ever since the outbreak of the Ukrainian war, you can see a constant, constant urge by Europeans, by some elements of American polities,、uh, to urge America to back to European, to strengthen NATO, to engage there, to basically、uh, have our boots on the ground, to reshift our strategic、uh, focus back from Indo-Pacific to Europe. On account of the Ukrainian war, now the Middle East right now is also another crisis. So、um, uh, I hope that the, our leaders will not be tempted by these distractions and shift our focus on、uh, on China away back to the to Europe and to the Middle East. We should learn history lessons. In 1948, 1949, the Soviet Union manufactured a Berlin crisis by blocking West Germany, West、uh, Berlin. And we respond with overwhelming Berlin lift. That Berlin lift lasted for over a year. Did not end until Chinese Communist Party took over mainland China. That was a strategic distraction of a severe historical consequence.、Uh, we failed to stick to its focus on Asia and the CCP threat.、Uh, this many people have argued, you no, know, who lost China? I think this is one of the reasons uh, why uh, the Chinese Communist Party was able to take China. Partly because of our lack of focus on the real threat,、uh, which、uh, would bring us to some of the most devastating wars that U.S. ever fought、uh, since World War II, Korean War, which is basically Chinese supported the North Korean invasion of South Korea, and also subsequent Chinese supported Vietnamese Communist War in the Indochina Peninsula, and even now China's、uh, the Taiwan crisis, it has a Chinese Communist Party. Uh, as the most important factor, so we have to really focus on the most、uh, important threat, and do not be distracted by other challenges in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. On that note of distractions, and going back to in your initial comments, in the backdrop of this is Iran. Initially, the Biden administration. Came out and said there was no evidence of Iran's involvement, which is obviously a touchy subject given the six billion dollars in assets they just freed up as part of a hostage exchange. But now we've seen the Wall Street Journal broke that 
We do have evidence of Iran's involvement in not only giving the go ahead to Hamas, but also in assisting and planning the attack. Um, and of course, Iran has shown no hesitancy in expressing their support publicly for Hamas since this began. So we have these things that uh, these events like this, that that they have a tendency to viscerally sort of shift U.S. focus uh, and attention. A colleague of ours, Mike Duran, has suggested on numerous occasions that Iran could be a key player in a Taiwan invasion scenario by attempting to bog down U.S. military assets and shift at least a significant portion of our focus to the Middle East while the Chinese make their move. Do you think the Iran-China relationship, I know it's, it's certainly hard to tell, do you think they have the sort of relationship where coordination on that level might be possible? Are attacks like these in any way, could they, could they signal a sort of testing of the waters of, of how the U.S. responds to crises like these and whether we can keep our focus across multiple domains? I don't think Iranians and Chinese are having a coordination uh, over the Taiwan issue per se. I mean, that's Taiwan is uh, far away from the Iranians' uh, strategic awareness, and they're thinking their objectives. Iranians also play the Taiwan card against China. So mm -hmm. China and uh, uh, Iranians were not 100% happy with the Chinese. Uh, there are two yeah. rogue states. <laughs> they have their own agenda, uh, their own ambition. So uh, uh, Iranian, as a matter of fact, uh, I would say is the only country that successfully exploited China's uh, uh, strategic paranoia over Taiwan. Because uh, when China went over to the Saudi Arabia uh, for a, a partnership, Iranian initiatives were not very happy. So the way they bring China to Tehran was to publish the headline in the Iranian newspaper say, Iranian people support Taiwanese independence. That basically made Chinese uh, leadership very panicked. So uh, they went back to uh, Tehran. So you can play China uh, in that way. So Iranians, you know, they they are very very schemy um, mm -hmm. on issues like this. I don't know whether Iran has a strategy to create a crisis for the Americans just for the for the for the cause of Chinese takeover yeah. of Taiwan. I doubt that. But Iranians definitely harbor no good intention. In Americans anywhere they can uh, degrade Americans' capability, Americans' influence in the Middle East, anywhere in the world, they would do it. And either way, whether it proceeds or succeeds any sort of a, a Taiwan invasion, they may certainly see an opportunity there. Uh, shifting gears to our next topic, you recently took a trip down to Dallas uh, with the Steamboat Institute for a debate with an MIT professor of Chinese descent uh, on the question of academic exchange with China and whether the current arrangement, uh, in the current arrangement, the risks outweigh the benefits. So the actual resolution uh, for the listeners was, quote, be it resolved, the risks of academic engagement with China outweigh the benefits, and the U.S. government and universities should must take steps to address this risk. You argued in the affirmative uh, that the risks are substantial and that the U.S. government should take action to mitigate this risk. Originally, uh, the audience voted for this. They voted before the debate began and afterwards. Originally, it was 54% of the audience uh, on your side in the affirmative, 38% against. And after the debate, uh, this changed to 71% for your position and 13% against. Your opponent argued along the lines that science should not have borders, that the academy should not be politicized, um, and that you know taking actions runs the risk of discriminating against Chinese students. Could you tell us a bit about your position in response to those, uh, those arguments? Even though I'm very happy that I won the debate decisively with the 71% uh, of the uh, audience on my side in the end, but that was not the most important. The most important is that we lay out the factors in this very important topic, and we had a very constructive, respectful debate. And I think uh, most of our audience benefited from that very robust exchange. So my argument was, uh, uh, basically this, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party wants to modernize this economy, its military, its infrastructure. But Chinese government knows that precisely because of lack of academic freedom, that would make American education system very, very strong and powerful. So Chinese government knows that it does not have the capability, does not have the education infrastructure to train the huge number of managerial and capable, talented graduates to reach its ambition for global dominance, for domestic uh, uh, dictatorship over the Chinese people. So for decades, the Chinese Communist Party's ultimate 
solution to solving that problem is to outsource its education, its training of the talented people to America. That's why the United States received overwhelming majority. Uh, uh, well, the United States has more Chinese students on American campuses than any other uh, 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 country's uh, students here. As we speak, there are somewhere between 290 to 370,000 Chinese students studying here in the United States. And do you know how many Americans study in China? 382. It's an incredible disparity. So this huge disparity uh, tells you a story. That is, uh, a huge number of Chinese students were here. Chinese government allowed them to come here to study. And over 90% of them are in the STEM area. I have the number here, which is pretty telling. Most of them are in computer science, math, engineering. Humanities constitute a very small number of the, the, those Chinese students here, about 1% to 2%. And here's the thing. Close to 90% of all the Chinese students who come to the United States return to China to serve the Chinese government in various capabilities. So that's basically what China wants to do. They want Americans to train its, its talented graduates to benefit China, not the United States. In comparison, India also is a country that sends a huge number of students to America as well. But only 20% of them go back to India. 80% of them stay in the United States serving American uh, industry and uh, American society uh, in a very positive way. Now, my opponent argued that, well, many of them, uh, m most of the Chinese would not go back because the American government would not give them opportunities. That is also not true. Uh, United States does not have a particular immigration policy tailored to one particular country. India, China, Indian students, Chinese students are facing the same challenges if they want to stay in the United States. If you want to stay in the United States, there are many ways to do so. And the majority of the Indians, they're trying their best to stay in the United States, 80% of them. Majority of the Chinese students choose to go back to China because they did not try as hard as the Indians uh, have done. So that's why um, I don't think the argument would carry the water. Another thing, when the Chinese students are here, they could not easily escape the control of the long arms of Chinese government. The Chinese government organized all the Chinese student scholars associations all across America with very strict control by the Chinese government. And many of the uh, Chinese students and scholars associations called CSSAs, in their charter, they have their charter saying that this CSSAs report to the Chinese embassy or Chinese consulate, and they're funded directly by the Chinese government. It's written in their charter. Their contact information is that of the Chinese consulate. So, I mean, you you, you know how the uh, the, uh, the Chinese government controls its citizens, even uh, outside of China. So that's why there is a, a very, very uh, uh, important way of Chinese government to coerce the students to go back. So that's why the 90% uh, of them go back uh, to China. Uh, secondly, I mean, not overwhelming majority of the Chinese students here, of course, they're, they're innocent. Uh, aspirants uh, for a good life, for a good education, uh, but there are state actors among this among the midst. Uh, so that's why the United States government has taken actions. If you look at the FBI's indictment the list, you can see a lot of them are uh, among this group. So uh, we should, as a sovereign nation, pay attention to the sovereign uh, threat posed by China in this particular exchange program. The Chinese government has spent a lot of money on American ca campuses. Uh, most of them were private and they're locally run. And the Trump administration actually conducted a survey. They discovered that over $1.3 billion were funneled by the Chinese government to the American universities that were illegally unreported. Uh, they were supposed to report to the government education department. They did not. But I will say this, in light of what's going on in the uh, COVID crisis, uh, we should learn the lesson that academic engagement with China is a very dangerous. It corrupts Americans' research ethics and their moral responsibilities. That's because there are rigorous ethical regulations 
and public safety regulators in the United States. If you want to conduct research, particularly on primates and human subjects, you would have to get a very prolonged process uh, to get approval. Many of the scientists do not bother with that kind of process. They go to China, they easily sign up with Chinese uh, partners and universities to do dangerous research. The Wuhan Institute of Virology was doing dangerous genome function research that was banned by the US government. But at least six American universities, including Harvard, University of Alabama, University of Texas in Galveston, and Echo Oil Health Alliance New York, and our own National Institute of, of uh, uh, Health are cooperating with the Wuhan Institute of Virology in researching dangerous, dangerous uh, 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 projects, including gain of function research. That is basically uh, ethical corruption, moral responsibility corruption. It's very dangerous. China is not a land of opportunity. China is a land of irresponsibility and the uh, dangerous ethical um, lack of discipline. My opponent actually made a very good point. He said, yes, academic engagement with China should follow the universal principle of openness because science does, should not have borders. I agree with that. The problem is you cannot have a so-called principled academic engagement with China when China does not really engage with you on any principle. China demands unanimity of opinion. It has a severe uh, xenophobia against any foreigners. When a dean from Harvard University said, oh, we should have a principled engagement with China, we should not abandon academic freedom, yes. But your so-called principled engagement with a country that demands unanimity, demands submission of your principal ethics, it basically amounts to nothing but code word for unprincipled appeasement to dictatorship and self-seeking egos and vainglory. If you don't believe me, try this. Try to ask your professors in cooperation with Chinese uh, partners to criticize the CCP and try to study the Cultural Revolution. Try to utter one word about the Xinjiang genocide and or even say happy birthday to the Dalai Lama and you and your so-called principles will be finished the next day. So that's why we're not facing a, a world uh, that is kumbaya. We're facing a world that's a government that has a complete demand, uncompromising demand for you to sacrifice your principle. So, I mean, with these problems you've articulated, the coercion of Chinese students, the sort of erosion of our own academic principles through, um, you know, these state-sponsored, state-run Chinese student organizations on our campuses, and even the erosion of our scientific ethics with, uh, you know, the, the sort of research our scientists are able to do going over to China. What should our academic relationship with China look like? I mean, I mean, especially if, as you stated in the beginning, we really are sort of facilitating or allowing China to outsource its, its STEM professional development education to the United States for the benefit of the Chinese Communist Party? Number one, we have to be very aware in every our policy, our national policy about China. The U.S.-China relationship is one of strategic competition. That's a nice way of saying China is the number one national security threat against the United States. So that being said, we have to keep in mind that our academic engagement is massive. That has to be put into the framework of national security concern. The Chinese student body in the United States on American campuses, which are mostly local and private, constitute about 40% of the entire international student body in the United States. There are 180 plus countries that send their students to the United States. 40% of them are from China. So this is a state-guided policy by the Chinese Communist Party. We are training the elites, the managerial talents for the Chinese Communist Party. Once you go to China, it's always very nice to say, hey, listen, this guy's going to China to contribute to Chinese private in, in economy, to work for their own um, career. Yes, but those who say such things ignore the Chinese reality. Whoever is talented, whoever is tra trained very well in the United States, go back to China. You can never escape the arm of Chinese government. 
you cannot be left alone. The Chinese government will come to you, will work for them. You have no other choice. So this is the why it's a national security uh, threat. Number two, and I think we should really, really uh, follow the Americans' uh, regulations and laws for full disclosure. If you receive foreign money, particularly the Chinese Communist uh, uh, Party's money, you should uh, report as a law required. Otherwise, you would be uh, 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 face some kind of uh, uh, punishment and penalty. Implementation of our academic regulations um, uh, should be strengthened. I would also say that uh, we should not be uh, subjected to the temptation of treating all Chinese and even Chinese Americans as suspect. There is a law. Uh, my opponent raised the issue of FBI's China Initiative or Department of Justice China Initiative. The China Initiative actually is a very interesting um, uh, organization. Now has been disbanded by the Biden administration. FBI is a law enforcement agency. FBI itself is not the law. It's not even above law. Law enforcement, you arrest people, you arrest a suspect, right? You go through the legal processes. You win some cases, you lose some cases. Uh, so you cannot just say, yes, you pick one case that FBI could not really uh, uh, prevail in the court of law to say, ah, this is the uh, use of excessive uh, force to target a discriminated uh, uh, particular ethnic group. For every single acquittal of FBI's case in the court, there are multiple more convictions and guilty pleas. So this is not just about the ethnic Chinese Americans. The FBI also charged some non-ethnic uh, non Chinese uh, scholars who have done something wrong in this uh, regard. The former professor um, uh, uh, who is the chair of the Harvard's chemistry department was charged, found guilty. There's another gentleman uh, um, also uh, who are non, who is non-Chinese uh, and who was found guilty. Uh, and so this is not about, uh, if you read the news recently, uh, the FBI has charged some of the uh, uh, suspect uh, who have been engaged in espionage uh, for China. Um, I mean, they are, um, there are some Ch ethnic Chinese and the two sailors, for example, there's also some uh, non-ethnic um, Chinese. So to use this racism car uh, uh, to play uh, in American law enforcement is very dangerous. And most importantly, it's factually untrue. <laughs>